Lord, I want to see. Lord, I want to see. Most of us need better vision. I know I do. I've always had a particular fondness for the scripture stories in which Jesus gives someone the ability to see. It's not hard to figure out why that might be the case. I got my first pair of glasses when I was in the third grade. In hindsight, I should probably have gotten them sooner. Even though they were of the heavy Coke bottle variety, my life was radically changed for the better, as I was now able to see what the teacher was writing on the board. Note to young folks, this was well before the era of Chromebooks and slightly after the era of stones and chisels. <laughs> Several years after I got glasses, a whiz-bang eye doctor figured out that I was also colorblind, or more accurately, red-green color deficient. The diagnosis provided some level of understanding for my poor fashion choices <laughs> and has relieved me of all responsibility for caring for plants or cooking meat to perfection. It's also possible that it played a role in my entering a profession that requires monotone apparel. My point in sharing my story about sight is not to garner sympathy from those who see better, or at least think they do, or to in any way minimize the struggles of those who have it much worse. Rather, I want to highlight how seeing, both for us and for Jesus, often serves as a metaphor for understanding and for faith. We need to recognize and to acknowledge how our history, our culture, and our own sinfulness can blind us in ways that ignore basic truths and prevent us from following Jesus. It may be reasonable for me to go along with the notion that grass is green because I have come to accept that I have limited visual acuity. It is another matter entirely to tolerate discrimination based on how someone looks. And yet, that is exactly what has happened for centuries when it comes to race, gender, or other physical differences. Similarly, our values and our priorities can become skewed when we start to measure a person's worth by the things that are easy to see, by their job, their possessions, or their personal attributes. It is amazing how those who can see can become so blind. In the eighth chapter of the Gospel of Mark, well before the passage we heard today, the crowd brings a nameless blind man to Jesus. Sadly, we don't hear this passage as part of the Sunday lectionary. In this first story, the man wants to be touched by Jesus in the hope that he might be able to see. Jesus takes the man aside and puts spit in his eyes, not once, but twice. The first time, the man gets blurry vision. The second time, he gets clear and distinct vision. Jesus then sends the man home. This story and the story we heard today bookend the journey of Jesus to Jerusalem the journey that Mark refers to as the way. There are quite a few differences between today's story and the earlier story. First, the man today has a name, Bartimaeus, suggesting that he was a person who continued to be known by the disciples of Jesus. Second, unlike in the first story, the crowd, at least initially, tries to keep 
Bartimaeus away from Jesus. Evidently, they don't care if he remains in the dark. Third, there is no need for Jesus to take Bartimaeus aside and to apply spit to his eyes. Instead, Jesus simply says, your faith has saved you. Fourth, and most importantly, Bartimaeus does not go home, although Jesus invites him to do so. Rather, Bartimaeus, now with sight, chooses to follow Jesus on his way to Jerusalem. Between the stories of the first blind man and Bartimaeus, Jesus interacts with many people who, as near as we can tell, have pretty good vision. Yet each is blinded in some way, some way that prevents them from following Jesus completely. You might recall some of the passages we heard in recent weeks. There were observant religious folk who were hung up on the rules for marriage and divorce. There was a rich young man living a good life and loved by Jesus, but who couldn't see beyond his many possessions to truly follow Jesus. There were invitations to become like little children, to accept the kingdom of God before the clutter of sin and custom and things intrude. And throughout, there were the disciples who were worried about who was in and who was out, who was on top and who was on the bottom, and who couldn't quite understand or accept what Jesus wanted to tell them about his mission. Despite their limited vision, the disciples will continue to tag along. Perhaps they were more like the first blind man. Over time, their sight will improve and their faith will grow. They were works in process. I wouldn't be surprised if many of us are like them. I know I am. In the meantime, as we grow in faith and in vision, we can find consolation in our other two readings. The prophet Jeremiah reminds us that God will lead us and deliver us, including those whose vision is weakened by cataracts and weakened by tears. And in the letter to the Hebrews, we are told, at least as regards priests, that we should be grateful that they are beset by weakness, since that is what enables them to be patient and forgiving. All of us need to see ourselves, including our weaknesses, more accurately, perhaps priests more than others. One can only imagine how the church might be better today and how a great deal of suffering might have been avoided or mitigated if bishops and priests had not been blind during the sexual abuse crisis. I am sure that all of us want to see a better church and a better world. To achieve that vision, we need to look at ourselves with honesty and humility. Let us pray that like Bartimaeus, we will have the sight and the faith to follow Jesus on the way.